Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to our Lunch and Learn series at the not-for-profit McLean County Museum of History. We always like to emphasize that indeed we are a not-for-profit. We do depend on the good graces and the resources of those who enjoy our programming, our exhibits, uh, our research availability, and things of that nature. So we do appreciate your support. So um, this program is being live streamed. A special thanks to our live stream sponsor, WGLT, on the campus of Illinois State University. That's Bloomington Normals Public Media, part of the National Public Radio Network. They're our sponsor, so we appreciate their support. Um, Time is of the essence here. Uh, I'm going to hand off the microphone here in a few minutes to Guy Fraker. Guy then will speak till 1245. We will then go to the Q&A, OK? Um, a little bit about Guy, although I'm sure just about everybody here knows him uh, rather well. Um, interestingly, he was raised in the state of New York outside of the Big Apple, hence Guy is a New York Yankees fan. Um, but his parents were from Illinois. He had family in central Illinois, so his ties here were, were deep indeed. He comes to the state of Illinois, the Prairie State, in 1956 to attend the University of Illinois, where he will earn a law degree and then eventually settle in Bloomington. Folks will know him as a local attorney doing what local attorneys do, uh, but many of you may not know that guy made his stamp on local and state land conservation through his work through the uh, Nature Conservancy and then more locally through Parklands Foundation. So he's much more than a Lincoln scholar and a local attorney. He's also a conservationist. Um, I think Guy's journey began when he was a child, his interest in Lincoln, but from an academic standpoint, it began in many ways in 2003 when he began to write a series in the, in the pantograph, Our Link to Lincoln. Guy first looked, this is back in 2003, that's 20 years ago, right? Uh, he first looked at McLean County and later Woodford and then Logan and DeWitt counties, right? Uh, from that came a 2004 article in the Journal of the Abraham Lincoln Association on the Daughters of the American Revolution, Eighth Judicial Circuit markers, uh, what Guy called the forgotten markers, but they're no longer forgotten because he's brought them back to the fore. Um, and then in 2012, of course, Guy um, will have published through Southern Illinois University Press his magnum opus, a academic study, a scholarly study of Abraham Lincoln on the Eighth Judicial Circuit, the first time that had ever been done in an academic press. And he followed that up a few years later with, um, oh, it's also recently just out on paperback. I wanted me to plug that, so here it is. If you don't have a copy, uh, it's now available on paperback. So um, he followed that up in 2017 with a looking for Lincoln in Illinois, a guide to Lincoln on the Eighth Judicial Circuit. So he remains an active uh, scholar doing published research and appearing before groups and uh, probing Lincoln's uh, life and career, the little corners undiscovered yet still. So uh, let's bring Guy Fraker to the uh, podium. Here it is. I'm pleased to be here, and I must say this, I don't think I'll ever speak again without bringing Kemp along to introduce me. That was a wonderful introduction. And uh, I really appreciate that. I also appreciate the chance to be here and uh, talk today, and I appreciate you all coming. 
My topic today is uh, something new. I gave this uh, once before at the Conference on Illinois History last week, and I'm writing an article for a magazine called Kansas History, which is this got me to put this together, and tr now I'm turning it into a talk. And uh, they, 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 I asked them if, if they would publish it, and it's supposed to come out like next summer. And she, not knowing of the, the stature of this scholar, she said, well, we'll submit it to it. We'll see what we think, and maybe we'll publish it. So we'll see. But I'm, I like the story, and, it, uh, and it really, it's, it's pretty timely. Probably help to get to it. I'm going to actually put glasses on today. Um, the, uh, the, the, the title of the talk is Lincoln Test the Waters. In 1859 is an extremely, it's about Lincoln in 1859. It's an extremely interesting topic and uh, one that's pretty much largely ignored because everybody says, well, you know, I had the, the Douglas campaign in 58 and then he ran for president in 1860. So it's been ignored and uh, uh, it should get more attention because of what he did that whole year quietly working to become president of the United States. Uh, the, the comparisons that I make, this is the year before there's a presidential election, this uh, 2023. Uh, and I count, and it depends what what day you count them. I think there, I just picked a number sort of arbitrarily, there are 14 candidates running the Republican nomination. One of them is a heavy favorite, Donald Trump. Uh, in, tw in 1859, there were 11 people running for the presidency. That's the comparison. One, the heavy favorite was William Stewart, who by the way was no Donald Trump. But uh, uh, there were, and there were dark horses there, one of whom was Abraham Lincoln. The dark horse got the nomination there. I'll leave it to your thoughts about if we can have a dark, dark, horse, a dark horse be successful this year. Uh, I want to mention first Lincoln's, clarify his, and you guys are a pretty knowledgeable audience, so you probably know this. Uh, Lincoln, in the, in, when this all started, uh, actually going back to 1854 when Douglas introduced the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which opened the territories to slavery, Lincoln was not an abolitionist. He knew that uh, to, to eliminate slavery just flat out would cause incredible trauma. And like most moderates at that time, his attitude was, if we just keep it in the states where it exists, then it'll die a natural death. It may take several generations, but it would not be at the cost that we know, know was paid to get rid of it, in fact. My, the story really starts with the Douglas campaign. You remember Stephen A. Douglas was the giant of American politics, the Illinois senator. In 58, he was running for re-election. And uh, Lincoln was the heavy underdog. And in those days, before the 17th Amendment, senators were elected by the legislature. So the campaign, I probably should turn that off. So the campaign generally were directed, direct, were directed at the legislators who were running by according to their politics rather than at the candidates. The unique thing about the 58, that was still the way it was, but because of the immensity of the issue, one issue, slavery, and the classic confrontation between this relatively unknown guy, Lincoln, and the, the most powerful politician in America, uh, Douglas, that got a lot of attention. And the focus was on those two guys. Uh, as you know, um, um, they had the debates, which are the classic 
political confrontation in the history of the seven debates all over the state of Illinois. Uh, the uh, Paris Prairie Beacon, after that election in 58, uh, had numbers in it that claimed that Lincoln won the popular vote. If you take those legislators who would support Lincoln and that had their votes up versus those legislators that would support Douglas, the Prairie Beacon calculated that Lincoln carried the election by three to 5,000 votes. But because of the, the districts, which some people say were gerrymandered to favor the Democrats, because the Democrats totally controlled the state. And there are those probably Democrats who are offended by that suggestion. So they say attributed to the population between 1850 and 1860, obviously the population changed and shifted. So 52% uh, of, of that vote, by the way, was for Lincoln in the House and 54 in the Senate percent. But the way it came out because of the districts and the nature of the districts, Douglas won. And, uh, and he won the election because he carried more legislators to, the, to uh, Springfield for the vote. Lincoln was devastated by this result. He, he, he looked forward, looking forward to 1860. He was too, this I'm talking about now, in the period at the end of 1858, looking forward to 1860, he was too discouraged to consider being a candidate again. He wrote a letter to a, a, a friend named Anson Henry on, in, uh, on November 1958. And this is sort of a sad note here. I'm glad I made the late race. It gave me a hearing on the great and durable question of the age, which I could have had had in no other way. And though I now sink out of view and shall be forgotten, I believe I have made some marks which will tell for the cause of civil liberty long after I'm gone. So he was throwing in towel at that point. But then, and then we have our own Jesse Fell, who you recall is a staunch supporter of Lincoln. And if you can imagine a corner over here at uh, where the old National Bank building was, I think it's maybe a voting office now. Fell was standing on a corner and he saw Lincoln come out of that entrance of our courthouse and walk across Washington Street. So we intercepted him and took him upstairs to the, uh, there were that Burpos, I think is the name of the store there, to the second floor of that building on stairs that are still there. He took him up there to Hersey Fell's, uh, Fell's brother's law office and proposed to him, I just got back from the East and you can't imagine the impact you've made. You, are, you have the strength because of those impressions to run for the presidency. And I urge you to write an autobiography for me because I don't know much about you. And I can get that distributed throughout the East. Bell had been out East where he came from in Eastern Pennsylvania and other parts of the East. And Lincoln declined. He said, there's no point in me doing that. I'm done. And uh, uh, so that, that's Lincoln at the end of the year. Okay, on January 5th, the legislator met to cast the votes for the senatorial race. And sure enough, uh, Douglas won by 54 to 46, notwithstanding the popular vote. The next day, Lincoln's supporters met um, to discuss who they could support for the presidency. Now this meeting was, Lincoln was at this meeting, but he's in contact, the meeting is set in context. Since Lincoln's taken himself out, who can we vote for this year? Who can we support at 60? So he, he didn't participate in the discussions till they just couldn't seem to reach. They were throwing all those names around, Seward, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, Bates from Missouri and so on. And, and finally, Lincoln, according to uh, David Davis said, um, well, why don't you run me? I can win. I can. 
I can be nominated, I can be elected, and I can run the government. So that stopped them doing anything for anybody else. But on the other hand, Lincoln didn't say, I'm running. But he, by speaking out, he sort of set the tone. <coughs> so, excuse me. So when they left that meeting, they didn't know quite who, what they were going to do. But Lincoln, at the same time, had decided on his strategy for 59. He was not going to be a candidate for president. That would mark his, be a target on his back. And again, some of the strong other candidates that were in the picture who were known to be uh, uh, seeking the nomination, um, he, he just decided to fly under the radar, is, is the way I would put it. He wanted to become more, raise his image, raise his visibility, but not as a candidate. Um, so, so then, a, 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 this is sort of an aside, but this, my story, my interest in this got going because of his trip to Kansas, which is the end of the story for 59. But it starts right here, a, a guy named Mark Delahaye, who is Lincoln, there, I'm, I want to write an article someday about Lincoln's knaves, because there are a lot of guys that he associated with and took advantage of their help that were not exactly characters of high note. And uh, Delahaye was one of them. Uh, but he went to Lincoln and invited him to come to Kansas to speak in Kansas, which was a territory at the time. Uh, Lincoln declined, but he said, maybe I can do it later in the year. Delahaye's wife was a distant cousin of Mary's who'd come to Springfield and practice law before he moved on and ended up living as a law and practicing law in uh, Leavenworth, Kansas. Now, Leavenworth is different. It's a town. And of course, there, you always think of Fort Leavenworth, which was there before the town. Uh, but Leavenworth is uh, significant in this story. Uh, the description I have of Delaware, that he was rough cut, robust, known for rap rapacity, which I don't know what that is, but it obviously sounds bad, <laughs> and heavy drinking. So he fits the mold of one of these Lincoln knaves. Uh, and uh, he and Lincoln had a case opposed to each other when he was practicing law in Springfield, so they'd known each other for a long time. Okay, by now Lincoln had decided on his strategy. So on March 1st, he went to Chicago and he spoke there, and he was, his top, the topic, he's, this was a, to a large crowd, still, and keep in mind, I don't want to keep repeating this, but he's never doing this as a candidate. He's doing this as just sort of an interested observer. But he was critical at this point in time, if you can believe it or not, the Republicans were so desperate for leadership that there was a contingent, including Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York paper, which was very influential, he was a nationally figure, who wanted, were trying to talk the party into supporting Douglas because Douglas was a reasonable alternative to the politicians of the South. And that brought Lincoln to Chicago to give a speech critical of those who were disloyal to the Republican cause by being that desperate to uh, consider running Douglas. Um, he, he, he then went back on the circuit, practicing law, including coming to Bloomington. He was here in, in Bloomington in April of 59. He, the Central Committee was meeting here, so pursuant to his plan, he met with the State Central Committee, but he, and, but he didn't speak, but, uh, but he, he just was here. In April of 59, uh, a man that had been a newspaper editor in Pekin that he knew had moved on to uh, Rock Island and was a newspaper editor there. He, he went to a number of the Republican papers to see if they'd be interested in do doing a joint endorsement for Lincoln for president. Uh, Lincoln wrote him on April 16, 1859. And here's what he said in the last paragraph of that. Number one, he declined to come to Rock Island. He didn't have time. But as to the other matter you kindly mentioned, I must in candor say, I do not think myself fit for the presidency. This is April of 59. I certainly am flattered and gratified that some partial friends think of me in that connection. 
but I really think it best for our cause that no concerted efforts such as you suggest should be made. So that was, that again, was Lincoln.